Welcome to our thought-provoking discussion on the captivating themes of collectivism and the extraordinary body of work created by Britt Marling and Zalba Monklage. Join us as we delve into the formative experiences that have shaped their collaboration and ignited their passion for exploring the power of collectivism. In this engaging conversation, we unravel the ways in which Britt and Zoll's artistic vision challenges the prevailing societal push towards individualism. Together, we navigate the intricate paths that lead us towards accessing collectivism in a world that often prioritizes self-interest. Furthermore, we shed light on the unique barriers that neurodivergent individuals face when it comes to embracing collectivism. Through insightful analysis, we strive to foster a greater understanding of the importance of inclusivity and empathy within collective spaces. Lastly, we embark on a fascinating exploration of Britain's All's fandom, which serves as a vibrant and united collective space. We celebrate the profound impact their work has had on fans, fostering a sense of community and shared experiences. Join us on this enlightening journey as we unravel the complexities of collectivism in the realm of Brit Marling and Zalba Manglage's cinematic universe. Don't miss out on this captivating discussion that promises to inspire, challenge, and ignite your own thoughts on the power of collective action. back and welcome to Life from the Labyrinth uh, where we talk about all things Britt Marling and Zalba Manglage. We are finding our way through their cinematic labyrinth, through their labyrinth of storytelling. And today we're going to be talking about the, we're going to be talking about collectivism. You know, Britons all love them some collectivism. Um, last week we put out a YouTube video talking about cults Mm -hmm. and cults would I think be like the shadow of collectivism. It would be like the creepier, darker side of collectivism. So we did a little bit of exploring uh, on, on that front last week. And there's really so much to say that I, Nick, I think we probably need at least a, a, a few more episodes on the whole cult conversation. I know there's so much. Right. Yeah. Right, but I think this is a this is a good continuation. So we explored the dark side. Now let's explore the the light side of of collectivism, and let's see where these ideas even came from, um, and basically how these ideas have landed on you and I. How they've what we've gotten from their storytelling, um, and how we have managed to find collectivism in this crazy world as two neurodivergent individuals who, you know, have a hard time. Like, hello, like this world wants us in little boxes. They want, it wants us and it rewards the individual. It wants us trapped in a box and, you know, but we're finding ways of getting around that and being able to like reimagine, uh, reimagine ways of living and relating to others. So. Let's get started. Nick, any ideas to get us to get us started? Anything you want to hit the ground running with? Well, I was just thinking about what you said about like the dark side, like cult being the shadow. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of just reflecting back on that episode. And I don't know that I guess the word cult comes with some dark or negative connotation. Yep. But I think a, I think most of the time, at least um, I know where I was coming from. I I felt this urge to continuously like transmute or um, reconfigure the word cult and like redirect it to collectivism. So this conversation feels like um, a leading, like we were, we were headed this way. Um, the right. Whole time. Um, it's a natural progression of kind of the ideas yeah. of that we were talking about previously. And you're right. You know, in, in our previous video, we mentioned how even the term, the word that we have for for collectives that happen on the fringe of society when we have the term cult and that comes with a bunch of baggage and you know you are an insider or an outsider based on your willingness and your bravery to get on the other side of the term like and i think that once from an outsider's pers- perspective yeah like the the term cult, everything that you imagine um, when you say the word cult, 
keeps you outside. It keeps you scared. It keeps you, you know, not wanting to explore collectivism because you're like, oh no, I'm going to end up in a cult. Like, but I think that the people that are um, insiders to that situation, the people in the cult, cult, um, feel, feel differently. They feel like they are a group of people, um, uh, working towards something or for something that's greater than themselves, basically. So yeah, um, Britons all have always recommended collectivism as kind of like an antidote to our, <laughs> to our modern times, to all our, basically like a panacea or like a soul balm to absolutely everything that's wrong in today's society. Um, Especially Western capitalistic society. Absolutely. That, absolutely. That pushes the, the narrative of the lone hero and, you know, the individualism that has just been kind of fractured and multiplied and mutated through social media and capitalism. So I definitely feel like finding you in this space has been definitely like a bomb to Aww. that um, kind of like rubbing raw of my skin trying to trying to figure out at all what this is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it can definitely feel occupying reality at this time definitely has left me feeling like, like, like I've been chewed up and spit out by life many, many times um, for many reasons. And uh, thank you for saying that. Cause I also feel like our, us meeting each other in kind of the fringe spaces that we have met in these online sleuthing spaces. Um, it has helped navigate daily life and the stories that Britain's all have told, um, have found a place to live inside my body and you know they have found a, i have found a way to let those stories inform my everyday life and keep me striving towards collectivism um which we will talk about later is 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 a task in in and of itself like um so we will let britain zoll tell us a little bit in their own words you know it's funny to get to know someone to really get to know someone I, 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 like you were saying that there are people in the audience maybe who want to do this work and stuff. And I think that when, when people want to know, like, oh, should I do my screenplay like this or should I contact such? I think maybe you should spend six years getting to know two people. Like, in, in the pleasure of getting to know someone, really getting to know someone, is immeasurable, in my opinion. I think we've, we, in the way we made this film was so much in the spirit of the experience that we had and the idea of wanting to make something in a tribe and, and to feel a sense of community about it all. So as we know, I think like the most basic aspect of Britain's all's ideas about collectivism could start just in the nature of how they've worked together since college. I think that's where it started, right? Absolutely. So, so they go for it. So they met in undergrad and Zal, I'm not sure what Mike Cahill studied, but it was Mike Cahill, Zalba Monglidge, and Britt Marling. Mike Cahill and Zalba Monglidge were already making um, independent films on campus at the college. And then, you know, enter Britt. She must have seen some of their work, um, became one of their biggest fans. You know, apparently the story goes that she stalked them until she became friends with them. <laughs> and then um they started making <laughs> it's amazing and then so then they started making movies together and you know kind of building their own independent film tribe and i think that they found some community and i think it also it's like they created some kind of compass or maybe even like vessel to kind of navigate into the filmmaking timeline that they ended up in because mm -hmm. all was studying anthropology um, Britt, I think, was um, economics and she minored in um, photography. And so they weren't necessarily heading in the direction of filmmaking um, yet, at least not to this level, until they encountered each other and developed the filmmaking collective, you know, the, the small little filmmaking collective that they had at the beginning. I think, you know, um, well, a couple things. I just watched a super old interview with uh, 
Mike Cahill and Britt when they were talking about, I was, I was doing my research for this conversation that we're having today. And they were talking about their work on the movie Boxers and Ballerinas, which is a movie by uh, Britt Marley and Mike Cahill. And it's a documentary that they filmed in Cuba. You know, you'll see a lot of this, a lot of this very Britt Marling talking about parallelisms and, and you know, how two lives can take on parallel, but like still very different trajectories. There's just a lot of um, interesting things, but all that to say, Mike Cahill was also an, uh, a business major. So he's like just some business guy. Yeah. That's, he mentioned that. So, um, so yeah, I think what they did is that they discovered, they like accidentally discovered gold. Like mm -hmm. I recently read somewhere, I have no idea where, somewhere in the millions of hours I spent online, um, I, I read something that said that humans are really only, like we're supposed to be making art. Like and everything else is just, you know, kind of a mess that we've gotten ourselves in, but like we're here to just, make art like and i think they discovered that and that discovery was so powerful that it set them on this like completely different trajectory than the future that they had envisioned for themselves and that were they were you know working towards very hard by the way like they were like brit was top of her class like she wasn't just you know what i mean like she was she knew where she was going and she was going in that direction and pursuing it hard, as hard as a person can. And, you know, she, they accidentally discovered gold, this, and gold being that like, whoa, uh, hold on a minute. Maybe people aren't supposed to be in cubicles all day. Um, basically slaving away towards money. Maybe life is about something different. Maybe life is about community and maybe life is about making art. And it just kind of, it was such a powerful discovery. Like, like you said, it like switched them timelines. It like, boop, it put them on a different life trajectory. And um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a perfect uh, summary. Um, well, I so know, I, 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 go for it. I just wanted, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, Britt Marling talks about one of her interviews um, with Sam. It's like the off stage or. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Those are good ones, yeah. Yeah, it's it's an amazing one. But she refers to her, Goldman Sachs, or maybe she just came to the realization in the space of that interview that Goldman Sachs was like her NDE, mm -hmm. where she realized like this, she could see what her life was going to be. She could see that narrative completely played out. And then it seems like, you know, if we're talking OA language, it's almost like OA or some other invisible self like came to this dimension and like crossed paths and like knocked her off the... Um, you know, accounting banker timeline right. into this other one. And then like, I remember the story of them making that 48 hour film festival and how, um, you know, she had been really grinding at Goldman Sachs and intern, you know, the internship itself and was super exhausted and tired. She didn't feel like she could do it. She decided to do that film festival with Brit and, or with um, Mike and Zoll. Yep. And she just, you know, said like, I was, you know, exhausted. I didn't sleep for two days, but she like you know she completely loved it and then that collective when they found that alchemical gold you're referring to it like gave them the courage then to to jump further to go across the country um to la and i feel like you cannot do at least i couldn't do um something quite like that something that drastic without you know without a tribe right without a little help from your friends as the saying goes um so yeah, I mean, so we've covered that they worked in partnership, like they had, they dabbled in partnership, which a lot of people, you know, it's not, it's not a simple thing to do. Um, it definitely takes work and you definitely need to find the right people to partner up with, to be able to, to be able to make something. Talk about what I think is one of the most formative experiences that they've shared with us um, that inform their unique, unique perspective on collectivism. And that has also like, it's found its way through every single one seemingly of Britain's all's work, which is 
their freegan summer. In my opinion. And so we decided to teach ourselves how to write, and lo and behold, it's really hard to learn how to write. So <laughs> that took many years. And, um, but we couldn't figure out how to make it work for us in this town. And so we decided to go have an adventure because we didn't know what else to do, but we had no money. And so freeganism feel, felt very uh, appealing to us because it's free. And, and so we decided to hit the road with some backpacks and some sleeping bags, and we decided to go for about 10 days. And we were so taken by the different groups we encountered that we went across the country and back. And um, it was an unbelievable summer. But they decided to hop trains across the country. And so I'm just, can you imagine like Britain's, I mean, I guess I can because of the East, but like Britain's all just like hopping trains across the country. They end up in Pittsburgh in um, a neighborhood called East Liberty, which fun fact, when I lived in Pittsburgh, I lived in East Liberty in Garfield, which is like right next to it um, and adjacent. So it was just an amazing synchronicity to be sitting and listening to that interview. And um, for that summer, so after hopping trains and just like really exploring our, you know, the United States nomadically, they end up in Pittsburgh and they find their way into like this anarchist collective um, that was living, you know, was living in Pittsburgh. They were um, dumpster diving and like trying to find recyclables and, you know, uh, lots of those high end, I mean, most grocery stores do it, but the high end grocery stores like throw away anything that's expired. So they were just going in and seeing what they could get. And I think they learned a lot about um, kind of living a lot more simply. And then, right. um, you know, I think Zal was telling the story about how, you know, at first, like the smells and the different people, it was very jarring <laughs> to be in that space, but eventually you just kind of settle into Thanks. it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, it's to hear that story and then to like enter in the East. It's like mm -hmm. clearly that experience was so powerful and the, the collective and the, and the community that they were embraced by and leaned into was so powerful that they wanted to tell the story. And then that's where we got, that's where we get the East. People. I, I think honestly what happened is that we had that experience many summers ago and then we, learned a lot from that and brought kind of that understanding of of tribalism and of making things in a collective um, and of doing it for very little or for free. Um, and then we made uh, two other films. And I think on the other side of that, we found that we just couldn't shake the experience of that summer, that it was still resonating with us. And not only that, the re its resonance had grown. Like it was as if the clamoring of it was even stronger than it had been when it happened. And why? Like why did we feel the need to keep talking about it with each other? And why were we so desperate to talk about it with other people? Um, and so we wanted to write something about it. You know, it's... No, absolutely. I think, you know, something that... I think something happened... I think you and I have experienced something similar um, when we took our one of our the first pilgrimage of faith, uh, OA pilgrimage of faith that we took out to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, that trip was so much. It just so much happened. It was so pers perspective shifting. It was so visceral. It was so much that we struggled for a long time. And in fact, our, this was over a year ago and just crazy. We're still barely at the point where we can even articulate some of those experiences. Right. And it was such an impactful, um, trip and journey and adventure that we had to make something out of it. Like it had to, the experience had to leave us somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, because otherwise it was just, it was like almost destabilizing I and mean, it was beautiful, but it was just such, it was just so impactful for both of us that we're like, okay, we got to do something. And we struggled for a, a year plus trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, this podcast is one of the things that is being born from mm -hmm. the trip that, that we did. So I imagine that they, that they, um, that they experienced something similar, um, so I just to add on to the story a little bit, some pieces that that I remember. Um, Britt has mentioned that 
they wanted to do like it all started with them trying to do a buy nothing day. Mm. So that is that is like a, a very seemingly easy way. It's like a little fun social experiment you can do with yourself. Um, to try to live outside of capitalism, not that we could, we can't really, there is no real way that we can live. The, the average person can live completely outside the, off the grid of capitalism, but you know, right. have doing a buy nothing day, um, which is just a day, like 24 hours, you're not going to buy anything. So you're not going to go out to eat. You're not going to put gas in your car. You're not, you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything you have to spend money on. And so it started that way. And they're like, well, then we're going to do a buy nothing summer. Um, and then that's where like the idea kind of just snowballed. And all of a sudden they're, <laughs> they find themselves in an anarchist collective across the country. Like, um, so that's, that's, um, that's interesting. And then I also wanted to add, um, we were talking about them accidentally finding this alchemical gold. I think something else that they happened to stumble upon or another aspect of that alchemical gold that they discovered was platonic love. Mm. So one of the, um, I don't know, I just feel like modern society uh, places this high importance on romantic love which is not a type of love that is accessible to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, most, a lot of people will just spend their entire lives chasing this, this one type of love when so much other type of love exists mm -hmm. and is, and is accessible and is available. Um, so they stumbled upon the, the true value of platonic love and, um, and yeah, I think uh, I think also like delving into platonic love um, opens up your world in a way that is unexpected. Like it's been unexpected to me. Um, I've been a person due to my neurodivergence and everything that comes along with it that pl relationships, particularly platonic relationships, like they don't come often. Mm. So when they do come, I really savor them. And, and yeah, that's something that I've learned too. Like platonic love is love and it's important and it's, it's food for your, for your soul and like get you some <laughs> in whichever way you can. Um, so yeah, I kind of veered us off track. Sorry about that. No, no, no. I think it's great. I'm glad that you brought up platonic love because in my experience now, I've only ever been in one, um, serious relationship and that relationship ended in 10 years ago. And then he passed away. So it's not even like there's like a residual, you know, like he's gone, the relationship's gone, mm -hmm. he's gone. Um, so I've really had to depend on um, platonic relationships really to kind of get me through. And in my experience, because of the nature of these relationships, a lot of the obstacles or the events in a relationship that could cause a lot of turbulence don't exist as easily or the feelings are different or that isn't to say the platonic relationships are without problems, but right. um, I know that they've lasted, they've been some of the longest relationships that I've had on this planet and um, incredibly meaningful. And I think it's important that you bring it up because um, it is love, you know, friendship, loving friendships are very important. Um, you know, my relationship with my younger sister, it's, um, Platonic is not a dirty word. <laughs> no. <laughs> not that it ever was, but. Uh. No, 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 it's not. But it's, it's, it is a love that will sustain a person. Um, and that can, it's really food for your soul. Um, why, I mean, you could go ahead and like starve yourself of, of, or feel like you're starving and not realize that you have a bunch of like food in your fridge. And that's what, that's what like, to me, I think it also ties into capitalism. Like it's one of the functions or one of the ways capitalism shows up in, in our lives where we no longer have these extended big families. A lot of us don't anyway. We're like one family. It's a lot of times it's not multi-general, um, multi-generational homes anymore. So like just family units getting smaller and smaller to that nuclear family. 
And, um, and that seems to be like, you know, that's, that's also like what's kind of sold as the American, American dream that, right. you know, you're going to grow up, you're going to have this nine to five job, you're going to have a spouse, you're going to have 2.5 kids, you're going to have a house, you're going to have the station wagon, you're going to have ha 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 ha. And it's just, that's not, you know, you have to be able to, that's not, that's not a lifestyle that is um, attainable for most, I would say right now. Um or, and maybe it never has been accessible to most, but you know, that doesn't stop people from trying and like really trying right. to achieve. But I think even the people who do achieve the supposed, you know, American dream, um, they realize that there is an emptiness. There's an emptiness because now they they haven't really maybe since, you know, society doesn't really um, teach us the, the true value of platonic love of and if you want to kind of stretch um if you kind of want to stretch the the boundaries of platonic love say queer love mm. queer relations the, the queerifying of of one's uh of one's heart really uh those are terms that are very very scary to uh to a lot of people in the west but um but yeah, we're going there. We're we're getting deep on the, we're getting deep on this one. Um, but yeah, so they go on this trip. You know, here I go trying to drive us back. <laughs> they go on this trip. They find themselves like digging through dumpsters. Um, that was just such a powerful and impactful trip for them that they had to do something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They had to do something with it, and I think that that was a super major uh, formative experience in them um, coming together and, and realizing the importance of collectivism. They're like, okay, we're going to talk about this as much as we can. Um, we got to try to like spread the word. <laughs> we got to try to talk about our, um, about our findings. Like they were little anthropologists that year, you know? So we're going to talk about our anthropological findings that we found. And, and they did it through art rather than like writing a paper or right you know, or making a documentary right they they're like okay we're going to do this through our art and so that experience i think has lived on um it, it's almost like the experience that kept giving for them mm. and i can very much relate like our san francisco trip like it was just but anyway we'll keep going so I know. Don't get me riled up. I would love to talk about the San Francisco trip at some point. Um, and we definitely will. We're going to have an hour of conversation dedicated just to that trip. And hopefully we can get some of our friends who were on that trip with yes. us. Yeah, I would love for that to happen. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about how this experience has shown up in their work time and time again, starting with 2011, Sound of My Voice. So in 2011, Sound My Voice, we see collectivism at play, but we see the kind of like, um, like, like we talked about, it was the darker aspect of collectivism. We see it's a doomsday cult. Well, kind of, yeah, kind of a doomsday cult. Kind, kind of. of. It's unclear whether or not, it seems like they're trying to save humanity. It doesn't sound like they're trying to opt out. But we only got the first part of that story. So, you know, we, right. don't, really, we don't really know what the true motives were of uh, Maggie. Right. So we see the cult there, Maggie's cult, Maggie being a time traveler, um, saying that she's traveled back in time to try to lead people that her knowledge of the future somehow can lead these people to salvation of whatever thing lies ahead of us that, you know, a lot of people don't make it through. Um, now, when I, we, we kind of, we briefly, we briefly touched on this, that it's the darker side of collectivism because it is a cult. It's like, it's like a cult, culty, cult, cult. There's no way around it. That's a cult. Um, but like I said, their work always deals with insider versus outsider perspective. And to the people in the cult, or in the group, in the collective, they don't necessarily 
see them as misguided, see themselves as misguided or, or anything like that to them. They're just working towards a higher purpose. And I guess, um, their higher purpose or the, whatever is greater than, than all of them put together is reaching this other side. Um, following Maggie into the unknown. I don't really know how, I don't really know how, how else to say it, but, um, so I definitely think that the collective um, theme is evident in that. There's kind of not a question, like it's there. Then we can move on to 2013, the East. And like you said, the East is basically like, it It almost feels like a, like a biopic. Like when, whenever Britons all tell the stories of their, um, of their crazy Train buy nothing happened. summer. Yeah. They're yeah. You can't help, but you know, for people who are familiar with their work, like you just imagine the East, like that's the East. So I think that that's where a lot of it came out. Like they were able to like synthesize and, you know, fictionalize their work um, just very, in a very real way. I think like the fictional part of that all obviously was like the, the fact that they were doing these uh, cultural jams, the, these kind of like guerrilla works of, uh, of justice, like these. Um, vigilante, acts. vigilante. Yeah. Some would call them like reverse terrorism acts. Um, or eco terrorist. Right. Eco terrorist. Um, Call it restorative justice, mm, you know. <laughs> but I mean, I think that was what you know kind of came from their imagination. But what came from their experience was some of the most riveting things of that film, which were the anarch the anarchist collective, um, which is arguably also a cult. Um, yeah, that was just. Man, thinking back on that film, I want—I need to do a rewatch. I haven't done a rewatch in, in quite a few months of the East, but some of those scenes are crazy. Just like, mm -hmm. but then we see a lot of the importance uh, placed on platonic relationships. We see, um, we see characters that are okay with queer love and just their own queerness in general and being in a queer space. Um, which is pretty anti-capitalist as AF, like if you think about it. Um, so yeah, anything to add about the East and capitalism, or sorry, not capitalism, but collectivism? Well, I think, I mean, the only thing I would add is I think in both of those films, Sound of My Voice and the East, that we have um, the infiltrators you know, we have Peter and Lorna infiltrating the cult. We have, um, I think her name is Sarah. I don't know why Sarah. I keep forgetting. It is Sarah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, the spy infiltrating the cult. And there's this, these moments of, you know, that outsider insider um, dichotomy. And then there's that discomfort that they feel when they first arrive in that space about how strange and, you know, especially in the East, like, am I, what, what is this cult space? And then to mm -hmm. watch those characters kind of like settle in and open up and join in to those spaces as they, you know, um, merge with the collective, I think makes me think a lot about Britain's All and how it must have been for them to be hopping trains and meeting all these different people to show mm -hmm. up in this um, collective space that they've never been in. And then by the end of it, it was such a powerful moving experience that they, like you said, fictionalized. And um, they needed to tell that story further, like further mm -hmm. than their IRL. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would have been like that, that. That would have been a crazy experience to sit with forever, to like just internalize and like have nothing come out of it. Um, yeah, that would have been a. It, it makes me think a lot about, um, you know, a lot of what I've heard Britt say about um, why she tells stories and how it's almost like out of necessity for just like coping and processing, you know, being alive um, and making sense out of this world. And yeah, so like just 
I don't know, just, just to kind of map that idea onto like all of their work. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what, you know, they're really trying to articulate what's going on in there. Absolutely. Um, so then we have 2016, the OA. We have um, the, yes, our fave, right? So 2016, the OA, we have the collective showing up as like a storytelling collective. Like it's like the little group that OA is telling her story to, um, very meta for Brit, you know, for Brit Marling, who is a storyteller and who is mm -hmm. like telling us her stories um, right. and who has us like holding on to her every word. Um, again, there are questions of whether or not that was a cult um, insider, outsider perspective, you know, the parents of the kids surely thought that it was like some culty things going on. <laughs> um, in season two, we see uh, that we get several pieces on collectivism. Number one, or I, not in chronological order, but I think in order of importance, we get the idea that you can't do it alone. Mm. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, you probably can't do it alone. And if you think you can do it alone, you're probably wrong. Like, like you, you should probably try not to do it alone. Like, um, which is of course the life advice that uh, OA slash Nina Azarova gets from the tree internet um, when she's in some like weird weird situation she like she drops down like, into the mycelium network of the of the earth of the trees of, of outside the yeah. yeah yeah so so we get that we also get a peek at collectivism and maybe the darker aspects of collectivism uh with curie which stands for the collective unconscious research institute so we see oh, that. The I didn't know that. That is a really cool piece. I always thought it was like, well, I knew it stood for something, but then I was like, was it a play on Curious? Ooh. Yeah. So Collective Unconscious Re Research Institute, um, where we see a billionaire is harvesting information, harvesting data from uh, his- from the dream gardens. From the dreamers. Yeah. So- we see how powerful the collective unconscious is, um, powerful enough to make a billionaire trying to get in on it. You see what I'm saying? So they, I think they were exploring the idea of there is a real power to collectivism so much so that, I mean, money can be extracted from it. Um, labor can be extracted from it, maybe even. Um, so yeah, it's a really powerful thing, powerful enough that, you know, a billionaire wants in. So if a billionaire wants in, you know, you know, there's worth there, you know, there's like high value there. Um, and we also see a very interesting, they bring up a very interesting, um, point when, for example, the, the, the players of the game Q Symphony in, in season two of the OA, um, what is Zendaya's, uh, character's name? Fola. Fola says, you know, Q doesn't like us working together at some point. So to me, that says, you know, we don't have, we don't have, we don't actually have answers on like who made the game specifically, who had, who made Q Symphony, but it is pretty much you can, it's, you're led to believe that it's perhaps uh, the billionaire of the story, which is um, Pierre Ruskin. Pierre Ruskin. Thank you very much. Pierre Ruskin. And I mean, and like, I wonder what Nina's role was because right. it's her, she was, Curie is her company. She was the partner. Right. Remember Pierre Ruskin's like, you are my partner in all things. Like, and she's like, I'm not your partner anymore. Like, right. So I'm yeah. Sorry. Anyway. So, um, I love you so much, Nina. <laughs> So we have that, like, so if the billionaire represents capitalism, so like, you know, big surprise, capitalism doesn't like you working together. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like, big surprise there. Like, so we get that piece. Um, anything you want to add about collectivism in the OA? So I guess I'm thinking of how OA, wherever she goes, creates a tribe. Um, 
Mm-hmm. She creates it with the boys and BBA to kind of heal her trauma as she arrived in that dimension, I guess, or escaped Hap's prison. The collective and the tribe that she creates with the Haptives as they're separated from glass in the basement. Um, the relationship she cultivates with Kareem and yes, um, how like she doesn't solve that mystery or try to go it alone. Although mm-hmm. she did when we met the tree say that she doesn't need anyone, but she's had Kareem the whole time. So she was never really alone, even if she didn't have Homer and the Haptives or, or the um, the Crestwood Five. Um, oh, good point. Then I was just thinking about, you know, that you already brought up that scene, but how like um, the only way to survive is to form a tribe. Mm. And how that has just been so true and I think so relevant to my life personally over the last couple of years, you know, I encountered this story and, you know, went on, went off the deep end really with it. And it wasn't until I found you and and our other friends and we did our IRL pilgrimages that I, and we developed this like safe space. Cause you know, and I'll be honest, like the fandom online is amazing, but in my opinion, it's not a tribe. It's an online, it's an online community. It's, it's a space, a tribe seems smaller and more intimate and there's an element of trust that I think has that has to exist. Um, and I think you can only really build that. Um, not not to say you have to do it in person, but like on a more intimate level. And we but, work yeah. really hard on being kind to each other and um, sort of checking in with each other, seeing how are you, you know, how do you feel, what's going on in your life? And Britt is so empathetic. She is feeling me and asking me questions. And then we kind of spend a couple days doing that and getting all of that out of the way, which is a lot more work than you'd think. Mm -hmm. And especially a lot more work than our culture sort of values. And then it just sort of magically, the trust develops, you know? And when you have that trust, you can send ideas back and forth between the two people. But yeah, I just, I think about how the line in the OA is like, you can't do this without forming a tribe. And then we've been, you know, working on building our tribe and that once you build that tribe and you have this kind of collective will together, you can travel through, you know, time and space and um, you can make greater jumps when you have a kind of collective will um, headed in the same direction. Oh my gosh, that gets me fired up. And we are going to talk, we are going to touch on uh, fandom as a collective here shortly. Um, so one more work that we have to go over is uh, this work, uh, the most recent, 2023 um, Murder at the End of the World. Again, the themes of collectivism pop up. This time, they it's like a millionaire, or sorry, a billionaire, um, like a mastermind collective, almost. Mm-hmm. It's like this group that Andy's brought together. Andy well, being the billionaire, cool. sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be a cult, too. Um, so we keep seeing this theme of like bringing people together, bringing people together. And there's that one line that Lee says, I think in episode one or uh, episode two, once Bill's died already and they're trying to figure out um, what to do. Like, should we go home? Should we call call it quits on this um, retreat? And she's like, I'm paraphrasing, but she says something along the lines of, um, I think community is the greatest thing we have in the face of loss, mm, something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. So definitely echoing the OA's message of you can't do it alone. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean we were TBD on on exactly where this uh, collective is going, what they're doing, what they have their hands in, what even is this? We're not even sure yet. So. Um, so we definitely keep seeing the this idea of like collectivism being important, collectivism being so powerful that it could even be weaponized, um, so powerful that billionaires want in on it. So like I said, they're definitely showing that it's 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 gold. It's it's if you can get your hands on it, please do <laughs> because it's. It's also okay. so powerful that you can identify a Jane Doe that the police weren't able to um, figure out. I think the online sleuthing collective that they highlight 
um, is incredible too. Um, Absolutely. Just because there is something, you know, I guess when we talk more about like the fandom and, you know, um, and that collective, I just think about how incredible it is that we live in a world where, I mean, it's how we met. Like if it weren't for a social media platform and this show's cancellation, like bringing us all together into a space, into an online space, um, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. So it's like, there really is, you're right, that there's something going on. B and Z really are um, kind of pointing almost directly at like form form a collective or connect mm -hmm. to the collective. Maybe we're all always already a part of it, the collective unconscious, but are you tapped into it? Right, and you know what? I think that, you know, is that what they're doing? You know, they do have this cult following that they they know is there. Um, not only do they know is there, like I've seen some things written by like some, uh, I don't exactly know what their positions are, but let's just call them executives at, at FX, um, opinions that are written online. And they're like, oh yeah, like they have such, they have such a cult following. Like they know, Britons all know that they've formed this collective. Um, the people who are interested in working with Britons all are well aware. Um, I've seen it, you know, said in interviews with them time and time again, like, oh, you have such a cult, such a cult following, such a cult following. So they themselves, whether knowingly or unknowingly, they've also amassed or they've been they amassed, but they've, their work has brought together a collective. For sure. And, and it's, they it's powerful. They know the power of storytelling too. So mm -hmm. when you combine it, a storytelling collective, um, it's quite quite a place, quite, mm -hmm. quite a thing to behold really. I think when you're making a film that is this sort of handmade and guerrilla style filmmaking, it can only come together and get off the ground because you have a group of people around you who are helping you put all this sweat equity into it to make something happen. So yeah, this is what we're going to talk about like We've talked about the collaboration. Yes, it's all chemical gold. It's a soul bomb. It's a panacea for capitalism. Um, but how exactly do we how exactly do we access it? Mm. Um, which is I, it's just an open ended conversation because I don't have the answers. I, I can't say that I've fully tapped into the power of collectivism, although I have had glimpses and it's been wonderful from what I've seen. Um, so. Any ideas, Nick, on how we access collectivism in a society that pushes individualism? Not just pushes it, but rewards it. Wow. Well, I think it's so hard to like turn it into like to make it a prescription or I know. Or try to break it out into steps. But I think for me, um finding my way to here and to the tribe we've created and to the collective fandom um, was almost born out of necessity for not finding a space elsewhere. And I think that I just had this moment, I mean, I couldn't pinpoint when or where, but I realized that I wasn't going to make it, you know, like the, the idea of like, working your way up in some fortune 500 company, working a nine to five and becoming like a CEO, is like the one of the running narratives of like being a business major. It's also one of the lines that was like kind of given to me or pushed towards me from my family. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that like I wasn't going to make or I, I wasn't really interested in that narrative, but that there was no way to really climb that ladder alone or that mm -hmm. climbing that ladder alone would be a very lonely venture, that whole dream and that narrative kind of just dissolved and shattered. And so I found access to this place by kind of like just seeking community or seeking other people that were going through similar experiences of these older kind of archaic now capitalistic narratives not working. Um, what are other ways of being in the world? I think that's what, mm -hmm. um, gra you know, that's why B and Z grabbed me because here we are some college graduates, Brit, the Valedictorian, Victorian with the Goldman Sachs internship had had the gold pun intended standard of um 
of what we think about having money and having a good job. And yet mm -hmm. she says, no, like that's literally going to kill me. I'm having an NDE yeah. right now thinking about that future. And so she left it and, and, you know, followed her joy instead, followed um, where she could play instead. And I think that's, mm, okay, okay. Now that I'm talking out loud a little bit more, if I were to say, how do you access um, the collective? I think you have to access your, your own joy and vulnerability and sense of play and like willingness yeah, yeah, yeah. to connect with others and to find a space where you can show up as your authentic self. Um, oh, Lord. I don't that, know. I don't know, I don't know what I just said. I don't you're even so know right. Said. No, you're so right. But that is such a tall order. Um, I would a million percent. We've had this conversation amongst ourselves before. Like, um, I would say what's what's worked for me in my limited perspective uh, is pushing to find a third space. Mm. Um, I don't even have a second space. I'm a stay at home mom. So it's like work slash home is just one. Th there's just home for me. You know, there's been other times where I have had access to third spaces. But at this point in my life, I don't have access to that. And many, and probably the majority of my life, I haven't had access to that. You know, like some people have church, some people have um, different like social clubs. Um, but that none of those have ever worked out for me, um, not for lack of trying, which we'll we'll talk about in a minute. But like, um, so paralleling to what you said, I was also I, I also found our friendship. Um, out of necessity, but also out of like being pushed to the fringes of like these fringe spaces online, um, which can be kind of like dark, kind of weird, sometimes scary spaces to navigate. Um, but I'm glad I went there. I'm glad I went to, went into the unknown. I'm glad I, I because eventually, like I found I found you. I found the rest of our friends that you know. Are, we're like a, a chosen family ourselves. Um, if you look at all of this from the outside or from the individual, it is seemingly impossible because it actually is impossible, but not with a collective. Because when a group of people get together and decide to do something, strange and mysterious things can happen. So what is it that you said? <laughs> Sorry. ADHD, no, ADHD, ADHD, dementia. No, it's fine. We're hey, we're we're. This is the, this is what we're doing. We're working out this question. Like we 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 wanted to explore collectivism and and our place in it and and how to access it. So like we're we're right where we're supposed to be in terms of kind of unfolding this. I was thinking about like because your question was like how do we access this, and that just sent me on like that just sent me on a tangent of kind of how did I get here, but if I think like practically or literally, how do I access this collective? It was online. It was through mm -hmm. social media platforms. It was from shared interests and hyper fixations. And it was from having these, you know, this incredible, like specifically you, like I had this incredible visceral experience of the OA on my own during lockdown. Um, you know, I was building in some plant medicines and like rewatching the OA over and over again as a performative art therapy. And like, the story just dropped down into my body. And like, I was like, oh my, what is happening to me? And then I had seen you post on one of your Instagram stories that you were on the steps in San Francisco. And alone. it was like, yes, alone. And it was just like, oh, it like literally gives me chills just thinking about it. Cause I remember seeing it and like, was there with you. And now thinking about how like I've been to those steps with you like that's why I was able to like be on those steps with you because I've been, you know, like I will have, I will be there at some point or have already been there. Um, but I remember thinking like, Oh my God, this is cause we had been in each other's like orbit online a little bit already from the cancellation and everybody kind of getting together, trying to figure out how do we save the OA and this story. And um, we were starting to create these little um, Instagram group chats and like Reddit existed, but I never really, I never really found a home there, but, um, yeah, you know, so we're in some of these group chats and like, I, at the time there was another, um, kind of podcast community that was, um, forming and we were in some like other 
like chat spaces and talking mm -hmm. and like I had started to hear your voice a little bit and we like we're kind of talking um adjacently but yeah and then you know come to that Instagram story where you're like on the steps I'm like this is someone that is also going IRL and embodying mm -hmm. the story and how amazing is it that I have access to someone else having this visceral experience from my phone from a screen oh a screen. okay Okay. Yes. So thank you. You help, you help bring my, my thoughts. Uh, Good. Back don't, lose it, don't lose it. <laughs> okay. So I think that between the both of the two of us, we can agree that some of the ways that we've um, accessed collectivism is the internet, mm -hmm. those fringe spaces online where we're talking about creepy stuff. That's like, could have us 5150 if we brought that same conversation into some other space. Yeah. Um, it, it, these certain conversations that happen within the OA tribe need to just stay in a safe space where, you know, but anyway, so the internet, um, vulnerability, mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of guts and a lot of vulnerability to say some of the crazy stuff and to share some of the crazy experiences that we have and to share some of the crazy theories and sh share some of the crazy dreams and, you know, just, um, those place, those those things need a soft place to land and like a, a, a nurturing place to grow. Um, so definitely vulnerability. So internet vulnerability. Um, play, mm. play. We've been able to be vulnerable vulnerable enough with each other that we are able to be in spaces that we're completely we're we're playing. You know, we're like little kids playing. And that has been so healing. So it's brought about like so many different fruits of many different varieties in my life, at least. Um, and I think the last step would be, yes, connecting online, but c finally coming out from behind the screen. Yeah. And going IRL. I think that was our kind of our path. And that um, takes that takes guts and that takes bravery. You always what do you always say about travel? Um, because I always like before I had met you, I had never really considered like travel. Um, I mean, not in quite such an OA context, too, of like just travel is what, what's your take on travel? Because I was thinking about how it takes bravery to go out behind the screen to meet strangers, but then also like getting on a six hour plane ride across oh, the country. Yeah. It takes just... risk. You're assuming, a, you're assuming a good deal of risk um, by, so it's an investment. It's like you're, you're taking a, a risky investment. You're putting your life on the line by like, you know, taking a across the country, you know, plane ride, you're spending money, you're hoping everything turns out like you're hoping you're not going to end up in someone's basement because someone ended up, you know, you, <laughs> You put your trust in the wrong hands. Like, um, yeah, it's it's it it takes many small acts of bravery. Um, it's so true the difference between because like we can connect even on this you know on this space we're connecting through a screen and the internet and still vulnerable to be speaking our piece. But to physically like I remember just thinking about like being on the plane on my way to San Francisco and just you know, um, you're really facing your mortality like the entire time you're on a plane, just just for the simple <laughs> fact of being on a plane. And then yeah. just thinking about um, how you're like traveling into the unknown, like you have no idea what to expect and then like leaning into it. And then we got there and I just remember, I mean, you just talked about play. I, I genuinely felt the entire time like my inner child was just out. Like it was such a healing thing where I felt like we were kids again and we were friends mm -hmm. that had met on the schoolyard and we were, you know, playing in our shared imagination, um, just diddy bopping around San Francisco, um, playing the OA. And it was just, ugh, it was incredible. Yeah, that's exactly how it felt like. We were literally like hopping and skipping down the street. Like we were just, it was such a happy space. We were very deep in play. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell like one of the just <laughs> hundreds of stories that we have from that trip. But, you know, there was a point where um, we were pretending we were making them making a movie. We we're pretending we were making an episode of the OA. And it like, 
you know, Nick was like behind the camera and like I was one of the actresses and our friend Peter was like acting. He remember how he got so into character. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, Peter, you're an actor. Like, <laughs> and it was just, you know, it would look completely ludicrous, balls to the wall, insane. Um, for anyone to like, you know, have an outsider perspective on what we were doing. Um, but at the same time, there was like a, a, a moment in time where there were like other, I suppose, tourists um, walking right in front of um, the OA house on Knob Hill. And we were so deep in play that the outsider perspective that I was able to witness these other people witnessing us was that we were doing something real, that we were really, I don't know if like maybe creating content, maybe we really were shooting something. And so like, they were kind of watching us for a bit, like kind of gathered around us. And I'm like, what is happening? Like, what is even happening here? Um, so that was just, a, that was a cool story. Like, yeah, you, you gotta be vulnerable enough to like play. Um, Which is otherwise. harder than it sounds. Oh yeah. Um, I've found that um, giving myself permission um, to play takes takes some convincing sometimes. Like mm -hmm. I, one of the ways that I like stay grounded or get untangled is I try to schedule, if I can, at least once a week having having like a a four hour at the minimum um, time frame where I give myself permission to not do anything productive. Like there's mm -hmm. no, um, just somehow to plug, unplug from capitalism and just, and just play. A lot of times that just looks like me laying on my phone or like, I don't always get to that place, but I don't know, I guess I don't have this thought fully formed, but I'm just thinking about how it's not a space that I can occupy so easily, but mm -hmm. I can occupy and embody playful Nick more often with you and in some of our spaces. And I have a couple of friends and like my little sister can bring it out of me because, you know, she's my little sister, but mm -hmm. yeah, that I just feel like, you know, you grow up, you become an adult. Like what even is that? Right. And it's beaten out of you. It's be like, yes, you're going to play and this is you. what I mean. Yeah. Right. So, oh, that's, that's what it feels like. This story is like, I feel like, I don't know, like we're being handed back keys to the playground. Oh, we're yeah. like Britain's all are like giving us um recess again. And yeah. that's just been a really, a really cool piece to have. Absolutely. I know different people have um different experiences and, and different ways of accessing play. Um like I've had friends who, by the way, because I didn't understand it myself. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I would like poke fun of them, but you know, they'd be like LARPing. Um, <laughs> they would like LARP, they would, which is live action role play, which is kind of what we were That's doing. That's literally like, what we did. Minus That's the literally story. what we were doing. You we know, were just doing the I movements had, instead. Exactly. Um, you know, it's similar. I guess people can access that. Um, like people who are like Renaissance fair people, Ren fair people. Like I've never been, know, by the way. Me neither. We I would go. love to go. Yeah, we don't, I love we don't to go. That. Yeah. So um, you know, cosplayers find their way to play um through you know dressing up. And and I just think that since those spaces haven't really been accessible or haven't really called out to me, I'm glad that I was able to find play again. Um so yeah, that's super fun. Um so Let's talk about a little bit of the difficulties finding community and finding collectivism, accessing collectivism, um, since we just talked about some of the ways that we have found collectivism, but what have been some of the barriers um, that we've personally experienced um, as neurodivergent people? Um, so existing the way we are and accepting ourselves the way we are and knowing that we can be no other way, what has been, um, what have been some of the barriers for you that ke that kept you from connecting, kept you from accessing that collectivism? Mm. Wow, quite the question. Right? Um, yeah, because I, I want to make sure that I... 
I have a few. You want me to read? I've, yeah. I've written down a few. You, you, you go first. Yeah. Okay. So I've written down a few. Um, jump in whenever you, wherever you see fit. So I have ADHD, which is autism ADHD. Nick has ADHD. Um, and one of the things, one of the overlaps of those conditions is uh, something called RSD, which is re- rejection sensitivity dysphoria. And um, it is a visceral, dysregulating, can take over your life and and leave you immobile for days uh, type of experience when one is met with real or perceived rejection. Hmm. You know, that I think that that's been one of um, something that I've myself have um, that's kept me you know, in a cubicle kept me, you know, being alone for, for a long time, that rejection sensitivity dysphoria, but who Lord, that is, uh, that's quite, that's quite a thing to, to have, uh, to have and to experience and to have to like figure out ways of how to navigate life, um, around, um, there's also difficulty assimilating. Um, so I've been, I've, been in third space type of groups, trying to access collectivism. Um, did a lot of good, did a lot of good work, was involved with like fundraising for very many different charities, uh, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there are certain things about a group that I find myself because of my autism ADHD, I cannot assimilate to like a little bit of the sayings. Um, there was this one group this one collective um, where everyone called, it was, it was women. So everyone called each other sis, like sisters. And I'm like, I would try it too. I'd be like, oh, hi, sis. And like, I'm like, that's not me. Like, I can't, I can't. Um, so I would do it, but I'd be, I, it wasn't like coming from a genuine place. It was, I always had like this visceral, like, Ugh, no, like, please don't. Um, there's also hierarchy, social hierarchy, um, and difficulty fitting into the pecking order or accepting the pecking order or acknowledging the pecking order at every single point, at every single turn. Um, that's a big one for me. I cannot and will not bend the knee. Um, or I should say, not that I won't bend the knee, but there are times where my adverse reaction to higher to social hierarchy has just been, it's come out in like the fact that I'm able to speak freely to people of authority or people in power where it's like, why are you speaking so freely to them? Like who does she think she is? Mm-hmm. And it's like, that that's been a big one for me. I don't know if, if you would agree or if you've ever that's how that's I am at me. any at any job I've ever worked at. People will be like scared of their boss or mm-hmm. scared of the manager. And I'm like, they're mm-hmm. just another human being. Like, what do you mean? Um yeah. and I definitely have been people thought that I was um ballsy for speaking my mind. And I'm like, I'm just talking to another human being. You're like, I'm literally being normal. Great. Like, like we're both we're both flesh puppets on a space rock at the same time. <laughs> flesh puppets. Um, there's also good old demand avoidance, um, which is another overlap that, you know, ADHD people um, experience demand avoidance. As soon as something is perceived as a demand and we can't do it. We, we go, our nervous system sees it as a threat and we go and we just won't, we won't budge. We go almost into a paralysis state or highly dysregulated state. Um, for on the autism side, I get like double the dose of that because mine's pathological. Like mine is like, I am driven by desire, not by demand. Mm. So it's, it's, that makes it like super hard for me to navigate collective spaces um, and that's just not like 
this, these are like visceral things. This, this is not like, like a laziness, like a, like a petty reluctance. This is a deep and gripping and, and really vicious, um, like attack that your mind has on your body almost. Um, and also there's barriers to communication. Like sometimes I cannot form full sentences there, are depending on what's going on in my life or this, the state of my nervous system or my nervous system regulation, um, where I cannot form a sentence to save my life. So days that I find myself, you know, on the verge of being nonverbal or just in, in nonverbal states, because it's, that's something that can happen um, that's something that I face that's misread. Mm. And, you know, if, if I have found that if I can't show up as an autistic person and like playing, doing this performance of self every single time, like every single day, then there's something wrong with me. And then people are like, well, what's wrong with you? Or like, who does she think she is? Or and, and I understand why, like if someone shows up and like, doesn't say a word one day, yeah, that's, is, are they mad? Like, what are they mad about? Do they think they're too good? <laughs> it's mm -hmm. always something. And so those have been my, um, my barriers to accessing collectivism. Um, not for lack of trying, but how about you? Um, I definitely... So it, it was a lot easier when I was younger. I don't know. Mm -hmm. something Something's changed in the last few years. I don't know if it's grief related. I don't know if it's OA jumping timelines related. I don't know if it's just a product of getting older. But And I have less energy or less willingness to like mask or pretend. Masking, to be there you go. Because I guess one of the first, one of the first times I realized I didn't have access to the collective was when I realized that I was gay. And this was yeah. in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, you know, the the messages that I was getting was that I was like abnormal or sinful or disgusting or gross mm -hmm. or like a pedophile. All of these messages that were kind of coming in that were saying this thing that, you know, and at the time, I, even as a kid, I was like, I don't have any, con I'm trying to control it. I'm trying to mm -hmm. not be this way and think this way and yet I am and so like there's something wrong with me I'm disgusting I'm gross I'm abnormal so I remember like and I'm very proud of younger Nick because I was able to alchemize that back then even at such a young age like in middle school and I realized okay fine like if I'm already on the fringe if I'm already an outsider I'm already an outlier how do I shine how do I become how can I become a part of that collective and so I feel like that is what cultivated this kind of social armor where I wanted to be the funny guy. I was, incre I mean, I was always pretty extroverted. Um, I'm a lot more introverted now, even if I can show up in social spaces and, and vibe and, um, and talk. But I really tried to be, to assimilate through humor and mm -hmm. through being the funny, witty um, character. I tried to be the smartest in the room. Like I had the best grades Mm -hmm. I was always the first done on tests, like didn't have to study. Like I really, I cultivated all of these pieces. And then um, somewhere along the way, I've kind of lost, like I realized that all of those things that I had built around me, which I thought were me and parts of my personality were just armor, were just safety right. to help me feel like I belong. And now that I'm in my 30s and I'm, I've figured out a lot more about who I am and I'm getting closer to the nadir of my being, um, I am also realizing that I'm driven by desire. And those desires, um, up until now, until the space that we're really in, that we're creating, like I wasn't really finding a place for OA Nick. Like I think that's really it. like grief Nick literally shattered and died. I became Cole when I moved to Pittsburgh. Like I literally had to mm -hmm. create an alter ego to even cope with being that version. But then when I moved home and I became this Nick and was integrating and trying to like figure out like who was on a Nick, I was searching for that community online, especially when the show ended. But I was like, in a lot of ways speaking and maybe taking the story more literally than a lot of 
the people online. And so I would mm -hmm. post on Reddit uh, or even Instagram sometimes about the experiences I was having. And then people would be like, you're crazy. That's oh, yeah. you're being too literal. Like it's just a oh, TV show. Nice. It's just a, it's just a, I don't know. Like, and blah, 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 blah. Like, no, 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 no. Rejection, rejection, rejection. And the message I got was like, luckily I was, I'm old, you know, old enough, even though viscerally I was still reacting to the rejection. I knew that it was just coming from a place of a lack of understanding. And I just realized I was like, oh man, I guess I can't just because so-and-so has seen, you know, user one, two, three has also seen the OA three times. Doesn't mean that they're going to have the same experience that I've had alchemizing this show. And so, yeah, I don't, I just, I've just found access to the collective by like building my own. Right. I, I think that was, I that was the answer. And a, a lot of what you were just talking about that I saw myself in, I think what we're both trying to describe is like, as we've gotten older, move past, you know, move through our thirties. Um, there comes a point where what you refer to as like the armor and I refer to as the, the performance. Mm. I think we went through that unmasking phase of life where we were either, we either, we either lost interest or, or lost the ability um, due to burnout, um, neuro neurodivergent burnout, or um, just lost, lost interest, lost, um, stop putting so much value in, in the mask and the armor and the performance and became like our desire to just finally be ourselves um, out loud, which not a lot of people could do. That's why people mask because, you know, people are always like, be yourself, be yourself. Well, when you have like, when you're a disabled person, like, yeah, you can be yourself as long as you hate yourself. Almost. It's like, Mm. as long as you're yourself in your room locked up like where right, no right. you, you feel like feel free be, to be yourself like be yourself but just don't show us like yeah is it's it's so true that is that is literally such the vibe because i almost don't know now how to not be myself it's just that i hide it it's not i'm less and less putting on performances mm -hmm. um although i wait tables so like it's funny to say that right but literally I play a server um, a couple of nights a week. Um, you play one on TV. Yeah, one exactly. On a server, I just play one on TV. <laughs> but I think that that is true. It's like I have spent so much time in my own haps prison of identity mm -hmm. and I'm done like mm -hmm. hiding who I am. And just because other people don't understand or because it's, neurodivergent or abnormal or weird um it's like i don't want i don't want to care anymore it's so much more it takes right. so much more energy to have to police and hide and like i just want this weight lifted like that's so much of what this project is for me with you and 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 taking up this space and finally just speaking it's like these are the, I don't know, I feel like there's something, there's really something about the story of building a collective and creating a tribe to travel and escape the prison of your conformity um, that I think we need to, and we are talking about. Right, absolutely. And I think that we'll, well, we can both kind of agree on that probably the biggest barrier to collectivism has been having to wear that social mask. Like um, if collective spaces were more inclusive of people with um, just with differences, not even just neuro neurodiversity, but like, or with people who are neurodivergent, but like just differences in general, we would have, uh, we would have found a home. We would have found our way to collectivism long ago. But you know, the truth is that you, unless you're willing to put on this perpetual performance of self or wear this perpetual mask, wear this perpetual armor, you know, you can't, you, you're not, you're not invited. Right. If you can't play the role perfectly, if you can't do all these, check all these boxes, then sorry, sorry, you can't, can't right. play. It also took me, 
I feel like I didn't start to feel a little more grounded or or like safe in my own neurodivergence and my own skin until I started to learn how to properly regulate my nervous system. Because mm-hmm. I feel like that is what causes a lot of inaccessibility or turbulence in a collective space mm-hmm. is when you have a bunch of dysregulated folks who aren't able to articulate that that's what's going on and, and they're bouncing off of each other. And um, I don't know, what do you think about like, how do we navigate that? Cause I, it's like, I don't want to play the performance, but I also like, so one of the other things that I encounter in collective spaces is when I encounter other people with dysregulated nervous systems that are kind of going through it and feel, I feel bad because I'm, I need to distance myself away from, from that. And I'm sure that is perceived as a rejection. And Mm -hmm. it's like, how do we then balance, you know, how do you balance your own nervous system in in neurodivergent spaces? Like all that's to say, just to like redirect it a little, is that like, it's hard to be in a collective with a bunch of neurodivergent folks or just folks in general. Right. It it is, it it is difficult. Um, We have, so our little tribe that we've built, is a neurodivergent tribe. Everyone has ADHD, autism, CTPS, CPTSD, some some type of neurodivergence going on, um, whether genetic or or acquired. Um, and we are we foster inclusion in in our own little tribe spaces by having neurodivergent only like this is very specific conversations about regulation, about like talking about like, hey, do you want to talk? Do you have a social battery to do that? Like, um, you know, you and I have had a conversation or uh, conversations about like, w- if I ever go nonverbal, like, I'm just going to send you some emojis. Like, please don't get mad. Like, please understand that this is what's happening. Like, those are conversations that need to be had in neurodivergent spaces. Um and I think little by little, you know, the everyone's nervous systems will start to relax. And uh, these were dark and often confusing times, <laughs> but they were also impossibly bright times because for all of our lack of success in breaking into the system, we were having tremendous success inspiring one another. Um. If you because nervous systems are going to do what they do and they, they kind of sync up like, like by Wi-Fi. And so if like one person in the, in the collective is regulated, then like all the other ones kind of follow the lead and start to become more regulated. And the opposite is also true where there's like one super dysregulated person. Holy, holy, holy. Like <laughs> it, it can wreak havoc on, on more than just that one person. So you know that saying where the, it's like you are the five, um, you're you're the five mm-hmm. people that you spend the most time with. I mm-hmm. saw it um, nuanced as like you are the nervous system of the five people that you regulate with, mm-hmm. and that it really, we really are. I mean, exactly as you said, like synced up to other yeah. people's nervous systems, and especially yeah, like I yeah. like it makes me think about my trauma. Not, uh, I guess I was gonna call it trauma. Uh, so it must be, there must be some drama in there, but I just think about like my role as, um, like my dad wasn't, my dad wasn't really around growing up. So I was like the patriarch of the family. So I noticed that like when I'm in my family dynamic that I really sync up to like my mom and my siblings nervous systems. And I start trying mm-hmm. to like regulate theirs and like, it has oh, been yeah. a lot of, it's been a lot of work. I will, I want to also note that like we, we have done, a, I want to give us props that we have done mm-hmm. a lot of work to kind of create healthy and strong neurodivergent boundaries to mm-hmm. have the kind of space that we do with us and our friends where we've done a lot of the work up front to make it a space that doesn't cause turbulence on the rejection sensitivity piece or the you know nonverbal piece. like we've done a lot of the neurodivergent um work to to set this up and i think that's pretty cool yeah, no, it, and it's it's necessary. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Like, right. it won't work. otherwise, we would run in opposite directions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the big trouble with Western thought is its emphasis on the individual, 
and that we're actually much more connected and interrelated than we even understand with each other and with ecology. So to kind of like steer this um, steer this conversation in, in like a, kind of like a fun, kind of like a little spicy, shaking it up a bit. Um, let's talk about the Britain's All's fandom as a collective. We've talked about it as a cult, mm. everyone has a cult following, it's a cult, yeah. cult, cult, we know that. Let's talk about it as a collective, right? So as a collective, it's the good, bad, and the ugly. But let's talk about the let's talk about the good. The good that is is that it's come together several times over the last, you know, since 2016, since it became like so the OA is basically the glue that brought Britain's all's cult following together, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um so since 2016, we've seen the Phantom as a collective work to try to save the show, try to raise funds for like, what did they do? They like, uh, they raised a bunch of money, they bought a thousands of dollars for, for the sign, right? For yeah, a sign there was a billboard Square. in Times Square where they did a, um, like a flash mob kind of dance protest, um, doing them, a group of people did the movements while that billboard was playing and i mean and it was like not even for a long time like that a spot like that yeah really like expensive. yeah super expensive it was like less than three minutes probably or something like that yeah it was and and that cost like thousands of dollars so the fandom came together and did that because this this show was so important um is so important to so many of us um i was in my cynical era back then and i was like no way that's gonna work <laughs> <laughs> Not to say it wasn't beautiful or to say it was like a freaking amazing attempt, but like we're talking about like this huge thing, bigger than we can imagine, has more money than we can even fathom. Company, Netflix. I'm like, there ain't no way, ain't no way that's gonna work. But again, that's that was cynicism of me back in the day. I mean, I was always obviously hoping it would work, and right, you know. I'm sure that <laughs> I could do a lot of big talk from my couch. I wasn't out, you know, I wasn't the one over there um, doing it myself, but um, yeah, that was, I think that was, I have a different opinion now. Like, I, I think that was a beautiful coming together that we saw um, valiant effort. Um, we've also seen more recently that the fandom has come together to raise money. I love this story. They raised over $10,000 to help like the medical funds for the actors and writers that were on strike during the, the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strike this summer. Mm -hmm. um, Brit auctioned off her, um, her OA wolf hoodie. Oh my gosh. And honestly, oh, I, I did God. not see, like I knew that the fan was going to eat that up. Right. But I was thinking they were going to, you know, raise a couple thousand and even, right. but it was like over, over 10 grand. I, f I forget exactly how much I'll, I'll put the picture up uh, if I can, but it, it was over $10,000 raised for that specific. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, and then there were some people online talking about like, well, let's try to like buy it from that person to try to give it back to Brit. And, and I'm not sure exactly what ended up happening if that was just like a conversation nothing ended up happening from it but you know i don't put it past them that they, that they have the power to do that um any thoughts on that just a little jealous that it wasn't me that won the option. <laughs> i didn't even get a chance to bid like yeah. i wanted to at least get a chance to bid but by the time that um because i live on the other side of the world so like your day is my night. My night is your day type of situation. And so like by the time I like woke up and looked to see what where the bidding was on eBay, it was already like in $5,000 territory plus. Right. I was like, oh no, I'm not going to bid on this. And then like, and I'm having to like pay, <laughs> like um, I'll leave that to the people who have deeper pockets than I do. But um, yeah, I thought that was incredible. Um, and it went to a great cause. Like the, the, to give people access to, to medicine, medical uh, services and food. You right. know, that the people who help make these stories possible, who were like in the middle of this huge labor dispute, 
thank God that's over for them. Um, so yeah, that was, but we've seen a lot of like really powerful things. Those are some of the things for, you know, that, that were kind of like the collective, the fandom collective coming together for good. There's been displays of power, like power in numbers. There's been displays of like power also in, in individual acts, but that was supported by the collective. Like the one person who did the hunger strike mm. um, in st striking against the, um, the cancellation of the show. Yeah. Like that is powerful. Like. So I powerful. And she said that she was, you know, what she was really protesting was capitalism, capitalism. And, and the mm. algorithms. And that's when she made that comment to Britain's all. Cause I guess they, she said that they drove by and like gave her a bottle of water or something and um, offered to buy her lunch. Yeah. Like to, Ooh, what to would you have done? Would you have taken the lunch? <laughs> No, because she's like, no, I'm doing it for the people. I'm no, to I wouldn't. I think I wouldn't have taken the lunch, but I would have gone to lunch. Yeah. Like I would have gone. Like if it was like we can go out and have a conversation, of course. I just would right. have only had my water, or maybe and like I think that, maybe like a tea. Oh yeah, something on calorie. <laughs> um, I I think that. Thank you for bringing that up. I had forgotten that piece that she was like, I'm actually protesting anti cap or. I'm protesting capitalism. So anything that protests capitalism is, is automatically in my book because what's the opposite of capitalism is like collectivism mm. or at least, I mean, you can, there's a lot of different answers there, but you know, one of the things, one of the opposites of capitalism, I would say would be collectivism, which is our whole spiel today. Um, but then again, er, so we talked about some of the good, some of the powerful, let's talk, some of the, some of the not so good is obviously a, a collective is bound to susceptible to group think um, exclusion as we talked about like yeah we're all coming together but who exactly is being excluded because um, surely we aren't all coming together like and that's been I, and I've been on the receiving end of the exclusion you know due to you know sometimes being due to the the fandom spaces but also sometimes being due to my own neurodivergent oftentimes being due to my own my own barriers that are like inherent to me um and obviously like what's a fandom what's what's a collective what's a good old cult following without some like infighting some drama you know and 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 it's all of those things it's like you learn to navigate all of those things when being in a collective and it's even still weird that like i am a part of the collective but i'm like not a part of the collective like it's 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 weird like i definitely feel at home here but not all spaces are home not all spaces within the collective um are home to me and we're going to talk about that we're going to get a little spicy a little controversial um so spicy question your top three fandom spaces in, what did I write? From from least favorite to most favorite. Mm. Okay. Now, I'll add the disclaimer that this is just our opinion. Right. It's just opinion for fun, opinion. but also the genuine experience I've had navigating right. these spaces. Right, exactly. So like, I'm not throwing shade to any individual, but like, I am, I've had an individual experience navigating this collective mm -hmm. so like i'm gonna speak my piece so and okay. obviously obviously coming from you know it's our individual perspective our neurodivergent take like how have different fandom spaces um what has been the experience of different fandom spaces um so we have reddit instagram twitter x we have discord Threads, TikTok, I don't know what, what you can think of, Pinterest, um, just any fandom spaces that you've been a part of. Mm. So I guess, I mean, to be a little corny, my favorite is the space that we're cultivating, um, which Aww. is a combination, I guess you'd say, of like YouTube, Spotify, and Instagram. But I right. found, um, aside from like the project that we're working on, Instagram was probably where I found the most connection and community. 
I think because of the way the platform works and like, unless you're following another person, you're not really seeing their content. So like there really is kind of um, an intentional connection. Um, I haven't really spent a lot of time on Twitter. I mean, during the, when the cancellation first happened and like the OA, save the OA hashtag was trending, I was definitely like kind of posting and just trying to boost um, that hashtag. I love the, so I guess it would go, so like Instagram um, or like, I don't know what to call our space because we're on multiple platforms. So we like, could call it the YouTube space. Or the Live from the Labyrinth. Okay, there you go. So Live from the Labyrinth is my favorite space. Instagram is my oh. second. And now I'm really loving um, the, so Instagram second, the Angel Neuroses Discord. Mm. Um, I do want to talk about that space. That I haven't spent place. a lot of time on it, but, um, and I got this from you. Um, mm -hmm. I like the stream of consciousness, like, aspects the chat uh it's live and it's adaptable and you can kind of like go in and out and there's multiple channels i like that it's more engaging i mean and it's amazing what they've been able to um come together to create and like get the gaze of um minzalba manglij has literally been mm -hmm. um on the chat twice and just like i just think that that is incredible and amazing i've had the least amount of fun as on uh, Reddit. Um, because anytime I've ever posted on there, I've just gotten judgment and hate. It, like mm -hmm. almost every single time without fail. Maybe, maybe recently, and I don't know if it's just because I've dropped my expectations about that space. So when I'm mm -hmm. posting in it, I'm not posting anything vulnerable. Um mm -hmm. that I'm like worried or looking for um validation or or what have you. But yeah, I just I don't know. I guess that's, I guess that's it in order. I'm really like hesitating. I like want, I want to talk about how, like, you know what? I'm just going to talk about it. And if we want to like, talk about it, just talk about it. Just talk about it. One of the things that really caught me off guard about the fandom in general is that, especially when it was first emerging, it was really, it was really amazing to be connecting with all these people. It's how I met you. It's how I met a lot of our friends, but very quickly as I guess maybe the collective just, came together quickly or just um, grew in size that very quickly people started kind of like gatekeeping or, or becoming territorial over theories mm -hmm. or ideas or particular interpretations. And then this like kind of scholarly um, side came into it that like, this is the proper way to understand the mm -hmm. OA show. Or if you didn't already have this insight, then you're stupid or that's a stupid take or why are you taking this so literally um it's just a tv show mm. those kinds of messages were coming in and that really bothered me and it just started to i just noticed that i saw a lot of judgment mm -hmm. on people's interpretation experiences of this show and a lot of claim to what the right experience should be a lot of experience mm. thing and that really hurt my feelings and kind of made me distance myself a bit from mm -hmm. like, I really did pull back from all the group chats and um, all of the things on Reddit and Twitter. And then I also, and I mean this with love because I've had some of my own, I think I've already talked about this, but I've had some of my own 5150 mm -hmm. rabbit hole off the deep end moments of questioning my reality as I've played around with this story but you know, this you cast a beautiful net, you're not only gonna catch beautiful things. And there's oh, a lot sure. of unwell, dysregulated folks that come through. And I have been at times as well. And so when you put all of that in one space, it's you know, it causes it causes some drama. And I've had to distance myself from a lot of, you know, just people that are in a place that I wasn't resonating with. And that's caused some conflict and mm -hmm. it just kind of bugs me because I'll see, and I know that some of these people that are like posting this and saying this, they must be having a, a connective experience. Like they're, they're finding their community, but they're like, Oh my God, the tribe is so, this tribe is so amazing. It's so loving. It's so inclusive. It's so warming. And I'm like, that hasn't been my experience the whole time. Oh yeah. No, I've, 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 so, I've shared that experience. Yeah. And so the way I've been able to like kind of back up and cash out is like this fandom is wide ranging, incredibly mm -hmm. diverse. 
And there's many corners of it. There's, there's many there's corners of it. Yeah. And but it isn't one homogeneous space. It's mm -hmm. like a, it's an assemblage of like heterogeneous spaces that are like rhizomatically connected to each other. Mm -hmm. And I've just learned to navigate it like you were talking about earlier and find the space that I can show up as myself and not mm -hmm. experience like ridicule or judgment or also being labeled as like mean because I had to take the space that I needed to feel safe and regulated. Like I just, right. it's not my responsibility to regulate anyone else's, you know, nervous system. And it's just, that's like, that's one of the things that like, even as I'm talking about it makes me literally like gives me the ick and makes me mm. not want to be involved in any kind of online collection. Right. Yeah. No, I, I've, I, anyway, that's, that's my piece. I hope I didn't come off sideways. It's like always so hard to talk about. Well, this is our space. It's like, you know, people are, yeah. people have their own individual experiences. Um, and, and what are you going to do? Like everyone, like some people have come into this fandom and they immediately found a home and happy for you. A little bit jealous, wish I would have <laughs> been me, right. but um, yeah, no, no one's here to come for you or anything for you, know, you sharing your piece. That's your piece. What are you going to do? Right. Um, so for me, based on my ability to access that collective and to show up authentically and to show up as a force of good and to show up as, I don't know, as like a, like a helpful, like being a helpful presence. Um, these are my top three fandom spaces. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna list mine from least fave to most fave. Least favorite of all time, least favorite of all time is Reddit to me. Um, if you found a home on Reddit, fantastic. You're probably really good with words. You're probably really poetic and verbose and and scholarly, and um you're probably incredibly smart. Um, there are like genius level people on Reddit. Um there are people who are very vulnerable on there. And, and though, even then, you know, I just had, I wasn't able to ever find inclusion or, you know, find a space where I could be vulnerable there and like not be ridiculed, not be downvoted into hell, not be ignored or not be like judged. Like I just, that wasn't my personal experience. Um, I also think that it was hard for me to be in a space that was so, in my opinion, stuck in, there's no way, there's no wrong way of grieving. I'll say this, but they were stuck in that grief of like having lost the show so much so that the possibility for idea exchange became almost impossible. Um, the group think there was something that I could not ever, um, I just, I just, it just made it impossible for me to be in that space um, because there was, um, there's only, like you said, there's, there's like just limits to how the show could and should be um, experienced, and anything on the other, on either side of those limits was like not, you, you can't talk about this experience here. Like, I experienced a lot of like conversations that were shut down, um, locked, and they were like, you know, right, respectable. Like what was that yeah. post? What was that post that got locked like most recently? Right. Luckily, the the mods, the mods, help, the mods worked with us after like. Oh yeah, yeah, we did. After, yeah, yeah, they worked with us after us, you know, being like, "What happened there?" Like, there's an example wrong. of us trying it to have about, a. It was that post was about whether or not anyone had ever experienced psychosis, spiritual um, psychosis from the OA. Spiritual yeah. psychosis dealing with the dealing with Britain's all's work. Um. So yeah, that that was that was definitely a space that I never found a home in, like you said. And um, yeah, that's my piece. Um, oh, and one of the one of the main barriers um, to me being able to fully consider myself an insider and part of that collective was I'm not. I struggle with communication, so my posts were never super verbose or 
flowery or, you know, articulated within an inch of my life um, with, you know, soundproof, waterproof, uh, you know, they, they would fail all the purity tests and people were like, there are no purity tests. I feel like there's purity tests and, and it would, it wouldn't pass any of those, um, any of those things. I do think that there's been a recent shift and, and I mean, I'm excited to, to see how that fandom evolves now that there's something beyond just the loss of the OA. Like there's now more to the story and you know, we were not locked in to be in this perpetual state of grieving. And like for a long time, I felt like some of the only posts on Reddit that were allowed, this isn't true, but I felt though, it was like some of the only posts were allowed were like the ones that were like, I hate Netflix for canceling the show. Right. Like, I feel like it had to be the only landing spot for anybody that was Googling. Why did the show get canceled? Or like, right. I feel like anyone that like, experienced the heartbreak of finding out the show was canceled right. found their way to uh reddit to complain about it. it it was a space full of heartbreak sadness yes loss uh and i and i've said it before like i'm kind of glad that we're past that like i don't want to go back <laughs> like right. um so that that's been that's that's been my where i've like you said i've had the least fun there um then my second one would be Instagram. Um, Instagram is awesome. It's what helped me connect to you. It's what helped me connect to a lot of, you know, all my my OA like tribe that I have. Um, it has been a way where I have been able to access um, communication because I'm not really talking at anyone. I'm kind of screaming into the void over there, and I'm able to communicate in images, which is something that I prefer because it's the way I, I think. I think in images. And so for me to be able to like, you know, kind of even sometimes sloppily make a meme and just post it on there with, you know, very little caption or no caption at all and be able to um, contribute to the spreading of ideas, contribute to the to the conversation, to the discussion, to the zeitgeist, to the collective unconscious of this whole group it's, it's available to me. Like I can access it. Like, mm -hmm. um, I'm also, yeah, like it's, it's my space. Like I don't, I, I'm, I don't run the, the risk of, you know, being downvoted or being, you know, there's, so yeah, Instagram has been great for me. Um, and it, it would, it probably deserves a number one spot, but I am, I am recently filled with hope or the collective that is forming over on Discord and the Angel Neurosis. Um, and I think that that space is, is being cultivated and the ground is being like tilled properly, if that makes any sense, or, or in a way that I feel myself being able to root into and be a part of. Um, like you said, the idea exchange is is wonderful. It's off the charts there. It's short form communication. I don't have to write an essay, like a scholarly essay in APA style. So right. like, <laughs> with like sources and with uh, sources and, and, and all that stuff, like I don't have to do that. I can just, it's like texting. Yeah. It's, it's like texting. It's like, it's yeah. like a, it's like a huge group chat. And um, so that, <laughs> So that has been uh, really helpful. It's really helped me ex access that um, that collective. Um, a lot of the moderators are, are, are really great. We have all kinds of res representation across, you know, very many different intersections of, of being and of existing. Um, there isn't a lot of vitriol. It's a space that's being cultivated. Um, through the joy of sharing in this new story, through the joy of, of being able to access Brit and Zoll, um, through the just the just through joy, it's brought together like some of the glue that's holding it together is like joy and and mm -hmm. anticipation and and cooperation. 
and and not this like grief and vitriol and infighting and 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 purity tests and all these other things that I've experienced other places. I think that the mods over there are doing a fantastic job. And I think that that space has, like you mentioned, has gained Britain's all's gaze and, and a lot of the different uh, actors and crew from murder at the end of the world. It's won their gaze for a reason. Um, so I'm really happy that space really fills me with hope. Um, I've been able to access it. And I think that at this at this moment in time, that's my favorite um, kind of corner of the internet for for this right now. Aside from the one that that we are, not, not to exclude the one that we're building here, right. um, there aren't very many voices um, that really follow Britain's All's work the way we do here on YouTube. So I'm hoping to, you know, get more of a get more of a thing going here if we can. If not, what we're doing is enough. You feel me? Right. Right. Agreed. So before we close out, anything else you want to add? Uh, I think I just want to, I'm like still feeling guilty about speaking my piece for some reason. So I just want to mm -hmm. be like, I, I have met some really amazing people in this space. I've met you. I've met our friends. I've cultivated the tribe. The fandom is amazing. I mean, it's kept this story alive. Any like conflicts and issues that I've had, are more just like individual differences, um, normal human kind of dissonances or turbulences, nothing. Um, I don't know. I just like <clears throat> someone I was just labeled mean for the way that I have um, interacted in this space. And I think that is so the opposite of who I am as a person and mm. the fact that some people have experienced me as such because of the way that I've had to protect my own energy in this space um, frustrates me a little bit, but it is what it is. I am very, I'm very grateful that we do have this space so that I can speak my piece. So my, the best way that I can communicate is through voice is through speaking. Mm. So to be able to have this space where I can like stream of consciousness, play around with ideas, that mm. is like the best medium I have to like process and think and create. So I'm glad that we have this and I'm excited to see what Angel Neuroses does. I mean, 900 people already. Um, Is it that much? Like I over, haven't even, wow. It's over, it's over 900. And you know, the fact that we get the opportunity to engage with Saul is just like such a cool thing. So. That uh, is, that is a really cool thing. Um, yeah. The mods certainly have uh a job on their hands, uh, moderating all those people. So, um, but right now I think they've built a really well-rounded uh, place. Um, the place that we, we've built a little bit more specialized, you know, for people who are, you know, who have these neurological differences and who are aware, um, we're self-aware of how that, um, those differences uh, make us move in the world. Um, and inform our everyday experiences, our everyday like decisions. So I don't think there's anything wrong with with you having your own personal experience. I know this is this all this is all part part and parcel. I don't know how what that is, but this is all part of um, being seen and mm -hmm. you know taking up space and you know daring to to have a to have a voice and. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, the fandom is big, big enough. It's, it's huge. It's, it's a huge expansive space and there's room for everyone. So, um, if you made it this far, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this juicy, very vulnerable conversation between Nick and I, um, feel free to jump in, um, in the comments or reach out to us on Instagram. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, let us know what your uh, fandom experiences have been, how being in uh, this larger fandom as a collective has been for you, or just any thoughts in general about collectivism. Um, if Britain Zoll's perspective on collectivism has impacted your life in any uh, meaningful way, we'd love to, we'd love to chat. We'd love to like hear what you got to say. Um, but we hope you join us on our next conversation, which is probably going to be about episode five of Murder at the End of the World. 
and um, we'll do a, a breakdown conversation of how we felt about that. Um, hope you guys are enjoying that show. Um, and anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe and bye.